work. Um, Deborah Small and, and Rosa Ramirez, they, they are really the leaders in the White Sage advocacy. And I've just had the real pleasure of working with them and supporting this work. And we've, we've been working the last, I think about two years now on a documentary, which we're really excited to share with you all tonight. So I'm going to um, provide a presentation. It'll be about 30 minutes long. We're gonna excitedly show you a trailer of the film. We're gonna talk a little bit about the cultural and ecological issues that are intertwined with White Sage and why we've created this campaign and the documentary, um, why it is so pressing and urgent and why it's so pressing to um, center indigenous and native voices in this work. So we'll share that. And then we'll have a question and answer session um, where Rose and Deb will, will join me and we'll be able to answer questions um, from the audience. And I, of course, will be sharing an update about the premiere, which is in San Pedro on April 22nd. Um, and we're really excited to um, do a world premiere in your neighborhood. And also, as, as David Berman mentioned, we're looking for some volunteer support for that. So we'll cover, we'll cover that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And can, um, can I be made a, a co-host? I think that's what I need in order to share my, share my screen. Perfect. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Okay, so we're just gonna briefly start here. Um, so Saging the World. Saging the World is a campaign um, that CNPS has started to support indigenous-led efforts to safeguard White um, Sage. Um, so White Sage, um, Sorry, I'm just hearing a little bit of echo. Um, um, okay, so um, the same- Hold on, hold on. Can everybody please mute yourself unless you're the speaker? Please, please, everybody mute yourself. Okay, so Saging the World is a campaign um, that CNPS has started with, with Rose and Deborah, and its, it's real intent is to support Indigenous-led efforts to safeguard white sage. Native people in Southern California and Northern Baja have long protected white sage and cherished white sage. And what we're seeing now, thanks to a lot of the, the initial work that um, Rose and Deb did, is a, a lot of um, poaching happening in our wildlands. Um, and this poaching is because the trend of smudging has gone viral. So especially in the last decade, um, mainstream media, television shows, celebrities, influencers, you know, undoubtedly you have probably seen sage smudge sticks for sale being used in uh, television, in movies. Um, and this is all coming at a cost. This viral trend is coming at a cost to our wildlands where we're seeing literal metric tons of white sage being poached on almost a daily basis. And that's coming in from reports from uh, publications like Mexico News Daily, um, just, just the other day, Alice Obscura um, published a piece um, with, uh, that was in support with Rose and Deb. So basically, we're seeing a lot of poaching unfold in our wildlands, um, which is related to this vast viral phenomena that we see with sage bundling. Um, and it's also hurting indigenous communities. And we'll talk a little bit later, and you'll see in the trailer for the film, that um, people who have tended a gathering ground for generations are going to that gathering ground and seeing it completely wiped out in service of this trend. Um, so it's, it's harming the ecosystem, it's harming native people and their relationships to this plant. And so CNPS um, with, in partnership with Rose and Deb have worked towards creating this documentary and this campaign to make a difference, to um, really try to reorient people's perspectives, to know what is going on, what is the truth behind these sage bundles, um, and to take some action that we'll talk about in, in just a moment. So um, the other thing I wanted to share before we show the trailer is that this work is dedicated to Barbara Drake. Um, she is a Tongva elder, and um, while she's deceased, I mean, she continues to influence um, everything that, that we do in the white sage work, and she's, she's just an incredibly important person. Um, and so this, the film is dedicated to her, as is the work for the Saging the World um, campaign. So I want to now stop sharing and I'm going to bring up, um, you all are officially the first audience, at least that I'm a part of that get to see the trailer. <laughs> so this is very exciting. Um, I'm going to share the sound, optimize. Oh yes. Okay. So are, are you all seeing a full screen here? Great. Okay. All right. Yes. Without further ado.
we all recognize it when we see it. Cultural appropriation, I think various cultural traditions are taken. And I think that's the key word, taken. Taken, but there's nothing given back. I ask everybody to learn about the sage and how to use it before thinking that taking a match or a lighter to it is the way to go. Nadie puede usar nuestras ceremonias porque las nuestras ceremonias son únicas y auténticas y propias. Over the last seven or eight years, I would imagine that there's probably been in excess of 15, 20,000 pounds of white sage taken out of these foothills. It's not just Americans anymore. It's becoming increasingly harvested in large quantities for commerce. In other parts of the world, was it really worth doing something that has a bad effect on other people and other living things just so you can have a smudge stick? When you change the way you think and you see them as relatives, you wouldn't go pull your grandmother out by the roots. You would love her caringly every day. That's when that mind shift changes. All right, that was the trailer. Okay, now I'm gonna bring up our PowerPoint here. So give me one second. Okay. Okay, so that was the trailer for the film and it's a 20 minute short documentary. Um, it centers native people that have, as I mentioned before, has, have had a relationship with White Sage themselves and their family spanning back generations. Um, and so sharing that testimony about the cultural significance of this plant, what's happening currently out in our wildlands um, and this call to action to start to understand plants not as resources, but as relationships. So I'm going to get a little bit into that. Um, so we're talking about white sage tonight. That's the center. That's kind of the emblem in, in the in the main, um, the plant of our film. It's Salvia appiana. Um, and it uh, really is endemic to Southern California and Baja, uh, Northern Baja, California. And so I bring up this map, um, native-land.ca, um, because this map shows the um, ancestral territory of indigenous communities um, across the world. And I focused in here on the um, natural range of white sage, um, just to really impart that white sage is a critical um, plant and, a, and considered a plant relative in all of basically all of the tribal communities that share its, its range. So all the way up to um, Southern San Luis Obispo County down to Northern Baja. And so between, between there, you have the Chumash Tri tribal communities, you have um, Ahashiman, Tongva, Kumaye, Kawia, uh, Luisenyo, um, and, and, and many more. So there are many different tribal communities that um, relate and connect with White Sage. And so it's really critical to understand that um, these communities and native people in, in these regions have had this very intimate and important ecological and cultural relationship with White Sage. And so I'm going to show you just a few, few examples that you know, some of these are put forward in the film in greater detail, but, you know, many people in the West, they see a sage bundle and they really think that, you know, it only has one functionality or purpose. And typically they see that in a very new age pseudo ceremonial context. But the reality is that white sage is, is just, it's beyond important to, um, uh, again, indigenous communities in Southern California and Northern Baja. It just, it transcends what you would even call a use. You know, you can think of all the quote unquote uses of white sage, but, it just goes so much deeper than that. And I think the sage bundling, the cultural appropriation ignores that. And so here's an example where Norma Mesa, um, she was in the trailer, she, she was the Spanish speaker. Norma Mesa's Kumaye, 
and she lives um, in and around Tecate. And she says that when um, they are going into a ceremony in her community, you know, they have to mentally prepare for a ceremony. And in the very same way, she, um, when she gets the white sage harvested in preparation for that community, she gives that white sage the same uh, preparation. She basically gives the, the white sage time to prepare, time to be in a quiet space, time to be in a dark space, away from people, away from arguing, away from yelling. And so it, it literally is treated as a plant relative. And that's, I, again, something that I think is missed in this cultural, this kind of larger trend of cultural appropriation. Um, Heidi Harper Lucero, she's, uh, she works um, in uh, NAGPRA, um, working in reburial. And um, in that process, white sage is a, is a critical part of, of working with ancestors. And so there's white sages used throughout that process, you know, in the funeral procession and the reburial itself. Um, and so white sage is also wrapped uh, up with ancestors. And so I think this just really imparts how intrinsically important the plant, the plant is. And Heidi's part of the Ahashaman community. Um, and this quotes from Kimberly Morales Johnson, who's also in the film. Um, and here you see, you know, Kimberly is expressing the view that these plants are plant relatives. And when you view it that way, when you view that these plants are a gift from Mother Earth, they are a relative, they ensure the survival of her ancestors in Southern California for thousands of generations. Um, and then you fast forward and you see what's going on with this appropriated trend now. You know, she says that's a way of pimping out the blessing. And I think that's a pretty stark and a, and a pretty, um, you know, uh, powerful way of, of summarizing it is just to see this really critical, critically important plant that has long been cherished in her family and in her ancestry. And then now it's being used in this commodified, totally culturally appropriated way that is, as I mentioned at the top, harming wild populations um, and tribal communities. So uh, there's also, of course, tremendous, a tremendous number of ecological connections with white sage, so many different pollinators and other fauna rely on white sage. And I brought up a few tonight to share with you all. Um, and as a preface, I wanna show you the range map of, of Salvia apiana of white sage. Um, and so those white dots are historic herbarium collections of white sage. And isn't it terrifying just how much development, which is that black layer, superimposes on those white sage populations? So the prologue to this story is that development has already, you know, almost eradicated arguably 50% or more of white sage populations. You know, people want to live where white sage grows and people are living in a way that, you know, um, eradicates these, these plants. And so the prologue is that development is already an, a, an incredible challenge to white sage and the remaining populations that exist are suffering from uh, habitat fragmentation. So if you think about removing white sage from the areas where it used to grow in these urban, um, where that black, sh where those black shapes are, you're basically removing possible corridors where white sage can um, reproduce, where pollinators can take pollen between white sage plants and spread the genetic diversity around. So um, again, that's, that's an important prologue. And I, I want you to just remember this, the kind of shape of this map and the density of these white sage populations. Um, I'm going to show you some um, fauna that rely on white sage. And I think it's really interesting to see, again, just how kind of these puzzle pieces work. So for instance, um, this is a valley carpenter bee. Um, and if you look at th these uh, observations are from iNaturalist. So it's a little skewed because, of course, many people live in the LA basin. That's why you're getting a pretty big concentration of ob observations of this bee. In this region, but nevertheless, you know, look at that range map down in the bottom left corner, and look back at this range map of white sage, and you start to kind of see the relationships. Um, and importantly, a thing to note about these big, chunky, beautiful bees is that white sage actually is not—I don't know the exact term for this—it's not gregarious in the sense it wants all of these different pollinators to come visit. It's—it has somewhat specialized pollinators. It takes a pretty fat bee, like the ones that I'm showing you to trip the, the flower to basically create, you know, have weight that settles on this really crazy complex flower 
for the white sage flower to then unfurl and allow this big fat bee to go in and, and pollinate the flower. So even though you might see different butterflies and bees uh, landing on white sage, the real pollination magic is happening with these, with these large bees. And of course, these large bees are also um, under threat um, for many of the same reasons that white sage is in terms of development and climate change. So um, I'm just going to breeze through. Of course, other, other pollinators like hummingbirds, many of you might have seen hummingbirds delight in salvia flowers and white sage isn't, isn't any different. Um, here's an Anna's hummingbird. And then of course the seeds, the seeds provide nutritious snacks for a lot of different species of animals. So you have the Western harvester ant, you have kangaroo rats, um, many, many birds. So lesser goldfinches, California quail. And then you get into um, the insects and animals that are feeding on the, the plant material. So um, all of these um, insects that I'll show you host on white sage. And that includes the alfalfa looper moth, the wavy lined emerald moth, and not that person, <laughs> this, this moth. <laughs> so that's the, those are the ecological connections. And I just, I share that because that anchors things just as the cultural connections do. Um, and you can kind of start to see just all of the relationships, um, human and otherwise that white sage has out in the world. And so that takes us to the viral trend. And I've talked a little bit about that. You saw a little bit about that in the trailer. And what we're seeing, especially over the last decade is this massive uptick in the popularity of smudging and its appearance on mainstream media and newspapers and magazines and blogs, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. So this practice of sage smudging um, has really become ubiquitous. And I show this, um, this collage, which we put in the film to just demonstrate, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you go on to um, giphy.com and that's G-I-P-H-Y and you type in smudging, you'll find almost an endless trove of GIFs just like these of people using smudge sticks. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of nuts. I mean, just in the sense that, you know, some of you might watch the TV show Secession, you know, the one based off of Rupert Murdoch. The first episode has someone saging a corporate office. Um, some of the clips on here in uh, TV shows called Generation, Long Island Medium, Teen Mom from MTV. Um, this is Keeping Up with the Kardashians. So it's just all over. Um, these are very high profile celebrities in many cases. Um, another one is Gwyneth Paltrow uh, and she's, uh, really put smudging in the forefront of her marketing and materials. I think at one point her email newsletter was called the Sage Stick or, or something along those lines. And then I include these because it, it's really become an international phenomena. Um, it's, it's something that's uh, has been become really popularized in Japan and Germany and numerous other, other countries. And we'll get into that a little bit when we start to talk about the commodification. So, um, here we have the white sage marketplace and you're, you're seeing a lot of um, abalone shells in here. Um, and I think it's important to note, um, Rose and Deb always, you know, remind me that abalone is, is kind of that, that ceremonial practice. Um, the cultural appropriated version is really kind of synchronizes these two pieces, white sage and abalone shells. And so you see those being um, sold alongside white sage bundles in many cases. And as probably many of you know, abalone is facing just as much of a dire threat as white sage is. And so it's just an all around um, menagerie of bad basically. But um, the issue is that white sage is now sold everywhere. And if you, you know, if you want to kind of like have your head start ringing alarm bells, you know, after this uh, presentation, go on to Amazon or Walmart, Alibaba or Etsy and type in sage bundle or white sage, and you'll find an almost en uh, limitless supply of white sage bundles and essential oil and incense and, and other products that use white sage. Um, and it's just really, it's really terrifying and, and heartbreaking because, you know, you know, we estimate that, you know, the vast majority of this white sage that you see on these online marketplaces is coming from poached wildlands. And as I shared, white sage is endemic to Southern California and, and Baja, Northern Baja. Um, so you really, um, you know, when you, you know, the way I can kind of see it is like when you're looking at a, a huge uh, page on Amazon full of white sage sticks, you know, th those are hillsides of white sage that have been stripped 
from Southern California and Northern Baja, and in some cases stripped from tribal lands and ancestral gathering grounds. Um, and so here's just a few screenshots. Um, Walmart, you know, Amazon, and again, these are just, I mean, this is just literally the tip, the tip of the iceberg here. Um, Etsy, and it's alarming too. I mean, vendors on Etsy celebrate the fact in some cases that their sage is coming from the from wildlands. I even think we we found someone who, you know, it, it seemed pretty, pretty certain that they lived close to North Etiwanda Preserve, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and they were basically like limitless supply of white sage sticks, you know, name your quantity and I'll get it for you. Um, so it's, there's kind of a, there's kind of no shame, I think currently in um, commodifying wild sourced sage products. Um, and Juniper Ridge, you might, um, people here in the audience might know about Juniper Ridge. They have kind of become pretty, pretty well known for selling um, wild crafted products and products that um, contain native plants. They're they're based in California, and for a long time they've sold soaps and incense and you know numerous other products that contain these types of um, our native plants. And for quite a while they were they were celebrating again the fact that these plants were being gathered from the wild. And when Rose and Deborah were um, starting this this work, they they stumbled on this map on Juniper Ridge's website, which they have since taken down which shows all of the store locations where you can purchase Juniper Ridge um, products. And so, I mean, this, this is just kind of out of this world um, that you can see on almost every continent. There um, are Juniper Ridge products, you know, a, a pretty um, sizable uh, amount of inventory is white sage related. And so it's just, it's pretty startling. Um, and here's an example where a vendor is just celebrating the fact that uh, the white sage is wild crafted. You know, they say, oh, from the coastal mountains of San Diego County, California. Um, and they'll allude to Native Americans using it, even though this, you know, just based on the context of how they wrote this, have no real conception of that relationship or understanding of the culture that they're, that they're trying to connect with. Um, but I think it's just very suspect and, and sad that people are, you know, marketing the fact that these, that these plants, these products are being, uh, are, are contain sage that's stripped from the wild. And so that gets us to the poaching. So you have the viral trend, um, which fuels demand for white sage products. Um, and you have all of these international marketplaces, online marketplaces, um, brick and mortar stores where people can buy that sage. So the poaching is what supplies that. And so again, evidence is popping up every day. And in one of our, um, key uh, places and partnerships is with the Edo North Etiwanda Preserve. Ron Goodman is a volunteer park ranger there and has been working to uh, confiscating sage busts for I think over I think five to ten years. Um, and so these these are photos that he shared with us of busts made at the North Etiwanda Preserve. Um, for those that don't know that's over um, in Rancho Cucamonga just past the east eastern border of Los Angeles County. It's up in the foothills. Um, of the San Gabriel Mountains, and it was set aside for mitigation of the 210 freeway. And there are park rangers, there are there is a charter for the preservation of the North Etiwanda Preserve. And even with all of those protections, you're seeing poaching happening now on a weekly basis, if not daily basis at the height of, of poaching season. Um, and you're seeing uh, th those busts can often be between 100 to 400 pounds. Um, also, busts are happening in, in Mexico, perhaps even more acutely. And so I mentioned a story from um, Mexico News Daily that, uh, you know, they're now seeing metric tons of white sage being poached from um, tribal reservations, tribal territories, from public lands. Um, and it's just, it's just massive, unmitigated theft of white sage on, on both sides of the border. And so here's another photo from um, Ron Goodman. And I think this is about three to 400 pounds. Um, each of those duffel sacks can contain about 100 pounds of white sage, I believe. And he, he, he points to this kind of evolution of poaching that's happening there, where I think about five years ago, he was mentioning that people would come out with those kind of plastic garbage bins and would fill up sage that way. And since then, there's been this whole evolution where people now go out with these backpacks and can carry hundreds of pounds on their back um, and, and sneak them in um, at night or in the early morning hours. 
and this is this is just a, a snippet from from Ron. Um, but you know, the people uh, really tragically, the people that are caught in the middle of this are often undocumented people who are just trying to get by and just just trying to to um, survive. And so it's not the people that are um, facilitating the black market and really profiting off of this poach stage. It's the people that are being sent out to these fields with you know a map and a pair of pruning shears and told to bring back you know pounds of this white sage and they'll get 25 cents in return. Um, these are the people that are being arrested more often than not um, in places like Etiwanda. And as, as Ron mentioned in the trailer, over 15,000 pounds of white sage he's estimated have been poached alone from the North Etiwanda Preserve. Um, and the photo, I mean, there's just, there's kind of sadly a, a large library of these, of these poaching photos. And I, I just want to remind everyone that this is a protected, you know, quote unquote, protected natural reserve. Um, and so you could kind of extrapolate that. What about all of the places on, on BLM land or places that are, are unsupervised or unmanaged? Like what's going on in those places when it comes to white sage? Um, and I think the things that, that strike me the hardest, like in filming the documentary, are the testimony directly from our indigenous partners, Teresa Romero, who's on the left. Um, she's the environmental director for the Santa Ynez Band of Chumash Indians. And she said, two years ago, I went to my gathering spot for white sage. And when I got out there, there was no white sage to gather. Um, and this is a story that I've heard now multiple times from different partners just that there is a there is a, a, a very special place, a, a place that this uh, this person has been taken care of for a very long time, that their ancestors have taken care of, and they go out and the, and the sage is wiped out. And I think, you know, most people don't know, just don't know, they don't realize that, say, if they buy a white sage bundle in New York City, you know, from a crystal shop, that, that it's likely that that sage came from someone's family's, you know, gathering ground. It came from a place in California where it was supporting um, all of these ecological relationships. And I think that's what we really want to impart through the film. Uh, this is just another example from Norma again. And she communicated that, you know, the indigenous, her indigenous community has 11,500 hectares or hectares. Um, and the other day she found many people cutting the sage and um, they pruned everything. They took it, they took it down to the ground. Um, and I think that's an important difference to note is that when indigenous people are gathering, you know, they're gathering with a, a really acute sensitivity to the plant, gathering in a way that promotes growth, taking care of the larger white sage populations, um, not pulling it out of the ground, not, not putting chains around plants and ripping them out, um, which poachers do. Um, so, so yeah, so I know that's very heavy, but <laughs> there's, there's a lot of ways that people can support um, and the messages that were, were the call to action that, that the California Native Plant Society that we're really trying to promote is one is to know your source. So, um, you know, it, uh, encourage people to ask store managers, you know, if they see white sage in a brick and mortar place like Whole Foods or World Market, um, if they see vendors on Etsy selling, you know, uh, unashamedly selling wild source sage to write to managers, to ask to speak with store managers, and to really implore people to stop selling sage products where the source is unknown. And if the source is harvested from the wild, then absolutely you know, ask and pressure to, to, to ask stores to stop selling that, that product. Um, so we're really asking people to know their source and to boycott wildcrafted sage products. Um, number two is you grow your own white sage and other native plants. And I think that's of course our rallying cry across CNPS. Um, and white sage is the emblem of our story and certainly a plant that we want to um, encourage people across Southern California and, and, and Northern Baja to, to grow. But I think the core message here is that wherever you grow, and we hope that this film goes to Tokyo, we hope it goes to Berlin, <laughs> you know, we hope it goes to New York and Hawaii and all, everywhere in between, is that those places all have native plants. Those places all have indigenous stewards and legacies and that you can grow the plants specific to your region and you'll be doing um, really important work to support habitat. So I know we're all pretty familiar with that message here at CNPS and that's something that we're um, pushing in this campaign. Um, and then the third is, is, is really philosophical but, but truly important, it's to reorient your cultural lens. And I've been really inspired in this work and really moved by um, a lot of the people in the film who I consider mentors at this stage in my life. And I, you know, Craig Torres, who's Tongva says, you know, see plants as relationships and not as resources. 
go from seeing them as something that you are in relationship with, um, that you can take care of, that you have the agency to take care of, and not something that you just want to extract, you know, a smudge stick from or medicine from or food from. Um, but that there's really, um, it's so much more important to think about plants in that um, stewardship and relationship kind of, kind of context. Okay, so we got through all of that and I want to um, end here on this invitation to our world premiere. And this is the premiere of the documentary. It's the world premiere, it's in San Pedro um, and it's on Earth Day, um, Friday, April 22nd. It'll be from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And what's really exciting is that we have um, hundreds, I think at this stage, about 700 white sage plants to give away. So we're hoping that everyone that comes gets to take home a white sage plant and we're encouraging them to, to grow them. Um, so we will screen the film. We will have a panel discussion with people from the film, uh, a question and answer session, and then the white sage giveaway. So I think it'll be an incredibly special night um, we're looking to, we're looking at about a thousand attendees um, and we need volunteers. <laughs> so um, I put out this call for all of you to consider um, as David Berman mentioned, you know, we're looking for people that can help with the registration table and ushering and giving away white sage plants um, and everything in between. And really your support would mean a tremendous amount um, for this premiere. And we can find the kind of role that that you'd be that you'd like the most. Um, so if you're interested, if you want to learn more, um, reach out to me. I put my email here on this slide, and I'll I'll put it in the um, Zoom chat as well. Um, but we'll be CNPS staff will be coming down um, either Wednesday or Thursday before the premiere, um, and we'll be getting situated. And so um, you know the, the screenings from seven to nine, but volunteers will likely meet around four on that Friday. Um, to, to huddle, to make sure everything's um, organized and ready. And then, you know, it's, it's go time at about uh, six o'clock uh, for, you know, starting to kind of set up the registration tables. We'll start selling tickets around that time. Um, and then people will be able to go find their seats. Uh, fortunately, it is general seating. So we will reserve some rows for our participants and um, VIPs and members of the media. But other, other than that, it's there isn't any seating reservation. So um, we've tried to take some of those complexities out of the event to just make it a really community oriented and, and um, um, just even just efficient um, event. So, so that is the premiere. Um, and I also wanna leave you with just a few more pieces of uh, reading material. So I mentioned the Atlas Obscura piece, um, which Rose and Deborah um, worked with the author uh, to produce. And I just think it's a really, really um, great piece that kind of encapsulates the whole message that we've shared with you tonight. Um, and, it, and it really puts forward a lot of the native people and voices in this. Um, and also the illustrations are fantastic. So check out, check out that article. Two other ones that came out recently are uh, White Sage in Danger um, by Jan Timbrook uh, for the Santa Barbara Independent. Um, and then why growing white sage can benefit your garden pollinators in the region. And that came out, um, if you just type in that on Google, you'll find it, it came out on a number of different local papers. So I just put the title here for, for you all. Um, and then the last thing is just, you can uh, stay tuned. We'll, we post everything, you know, all announcements and things at cnps.org slash saging the world. Um, and that's our presentation for tonight. So thanks again for, for, um, letting me share all of this. And um, Rose, Deborah, and I will be, be here to um, answer any questions. Thanks, David. Um, this is such an exciting event. And um, I think really, to me, the key is, is really, you know, we need to all change the way we think about our relationships with our environment, not just the plants, but the animals and, and everything. Uh, and this, you know, um, entitlement mentality, you know, that mine, I could do whatever I want with it. And then man, the idea that man can sort of overwhelm nature and control it and, and everything. I mean, we need to learn how to live with it or we're doomed. So I think it's a, it's a, a great, it looks like it's going to be a fabulous film. I really look forward to seeing it. And I think it's going to be a fabulous event. Um, so We'll take questions. Either people could unmute yourself and ask them, or you could put your question in the chat. 
you don't want to talk out loud, and I'll read it. Um, but it's a great opportunity to take advantage of our speakers. Um, So let me ask you this, are, are, are there people uh, who are growing um, white sage commercially? Are there any farms that are, are in, any people farming it? Because that would seem to me like it would be relatively easy thing to do and, and more efficient. So that's the question, are there people farming it? <laughs> um. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, that was one of the things that Deborah and I wanted to know early on when we found so much sage being sold on the market. So we did find um, a grower in eastern San Diego County called Sage Wind Farm. Uh, Ken and Ellen uh, run this farm. They've had it for 15 years. It's certified organic. And uh, other, other than that, um, they, they have a, the sun is also growing it closer to the coast. And there are a few other places. There's a couple in Oregon that grow medicinal herbs that also grow white sage. But the large growers, I think there's also Rose Mountain uh, Botanics. I'm not sure the exact name, Deborah will know it. Um, they also started growing in San Diego County. So it is happening, starting to happen more now, but Sagewind Farm started, probably was the first. Um, and they, you know, their sages purchased uh, from people all over the world, from businesses and individuals all over the world. Um, they do tend to be a little bit more expensive than uh, the trade shop sage, but that's because they grow it and it is organic. Um, we, there is some controversy about selling sage amongst the um, native communities. And it's, um, it's generally sacred plants are not sold, medicinal plants um, and most other plants are considered sacred. So, but that is, changing with some native people because of the damage that's being done. There has to be uh, other ways people can get to some of these plants for other uses without having to purchase uh, poached sage or to go out and forage. Uh, foraging is also a form of poaching. And unfortunately, places like the LA Basin has what, 20 million people? And we have a lot of nature walks and the more we take people out or show them where things are or where they are, how to gather them, we have to be concerned about the amount of people that potentially also can go out and gather. So we do want uh, to have growers. Matter of fact, Sagewind Farms does provide sage to some tribes uh, who have difficulty gathering their own uh, for a variety of reasons, including climate change and poaching. So they have turned to Sagewind Farms, which is really great. We think that this um, is probably done by a lot of native people individually where they go and purchase and they need to have a source where they can purchase, um, you know, uh, an, a um, unpoached, unstolen, sage, but that's also uh, not harmful because there's a lot of other problems with poached sage. But we, we do believe that once this information really gets out more and more, uh, we will have more growers, uh, as well as hoping people will grow it at home. Um, and once we have a lot of growers, this is one of the ways we're going to quell that, po that need for poaching. Is, is having better consumers. Great. There's a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, Christine asks, would the non-culturally appropriate term be smoke cleansing rather than smudging? Um, I, I, the, the thing is, 
it really isn't about the terms. It's Native people have for a very long, many decades have been concerned about cultural appropriation and of many things, including white sage. White sage has been a really open and obvious one. Um, what Native people don't want is for people to try to imitate Native ceremony. It's so it isn't so much if you decide to burn it as incense that or use it in a tea, um, but it's when there's the abalone, feathers, chanting, and the white sage is very commonly sold as a kit because it's, uh, it's, it's promoting a pseudo Native American use. And that's, that's really where uh, it shouldn't be done. Uh, you can use it if you get it from a good source or you grow it, um, but just not imitate Native people. There was a question and it was answered in the, um, uh, uh, in the chat, a botanical question, and that is, can white sage grow next to purple and black sage without it becoming a hybrid? these other uh, plants. And um, Tony uh, Baker replied that white sage will in fact hybridize with purple and black sage. So this brings up another issue that, you know, for people that live next to a preserve or near a preserve, um, you have to be careful what you plant and how you plant it and things like that. So that, that's uh, a potential issue. Um, Somewhat related to that, I was going to ask, um, what about uh, community gardens? Uh, would that be a, a, an opportunity for people to, to grow uh, white sage? Yeah, I think we're seeing some of that. And um, one of the things that you'll see in the documentary, um, you, you met Teresa um, and Diego, the two people talking from Santa Ynez Nursery. and um, and. So they have a nursery there and they're growing specifically white sage. They're growing lots of the native plants for the Chumash community. Now they're not a commercial endeavor. They're a tribal endeavor, but they're really growing all the different plants out, including white sage. Because, um, you know, as you saw from the trailer that, um, or maybe it's the slide that David showed that, um, that, you know, Teresa lost, you know, lots of her sage gathering grounds when she went out to gather it. And so, so I think we're going to see more of um, the different tribal groups growing their, their own um, native plants. But I think community gardens and, um, and even farms now are, are interested in when they're realizing the value of native plants as, as um, pollinating or, you know, attracting pollinators for, for all their, um, you know, whatever they're farming, those kinds of things. So there's a place here in San Diego called Solidarity Farms. And they're actually on the Palmer Reservation there, they're sharing the land. And um, they're growing lots of the native plants, including white sage. So as people become aware of the problems, I think we're gonna see a lot more people, you know, having them in their community farms and things like that. And that, that's our hope that, you know, I mean, I, I really, our message, probably our primary message is as much cultivation as possible. And a lot of people are starting to use this phrase, cultivation is now conservation, or conservation is cultivation, which seems to fit perfectly with the California Native Plant Society, you know, mission. And, um, and you've all known that before, but, you know, for other people, I think it's a great way to think about what you're doing. But, you know, people want to help conserve. What can we do for the planet? Well, cultivation is a great thing, as long as you do it, you know, appropriately and things. You know. Right. So. <laughs> well, people can manage to mess up anything, but yeah, I think uh, <laughs> cultivation of, um, uh, of native plants, of uh, food, uh, you know, um, I think uh, distributive, Still better, so. distributive culture, distributive energy is 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 democracy. It's it's conservation. It's everything. All right. Um, so David uh, added uh, white sage, black sage, purple sage, and even uh, chia. Uh, hybridized naturally in the wild, and Etiwanda has lived to hybrids that I've encountered. Um, and uh, Tony adds that we have that on the peninsula as well. You know, to me, I mean, ever since I've been involved in this organization, there's always a challenge to know, um, you know, what is native, what is not native, you know. Um, 
you know, because there, there has been uh, uh, people here for many years who stewarded the land and stewarded the plants, and, and that has had some impact in the past, not nearly the impact that we're seeing from things like, you know, poaching metric tons per day. Um, uh, it's just an interesting question, you know, what, what's native and what's natural and what's not natural. So, all right. Um, okay. So uh, Cyrus asks, can any of the hybrids reproduce naturally? I'm a big fan of Salvia Desperado, which is a white purple hybrid. That's a great question. I mean, my, I, in my vision, I imagine like, I met, some of you might know the thistle sage, the Salvia Carduacea, it just looks incredible. And I'm I'm just fantasizing about a white sage hybridizing with thistle sage, <laughs> but I don't I don't know what happens when I don't I don't know if the hybrids themselves can reproduce, but that would be a really interesting experiment. Um, yeah, I think it's a mule, the, the desperado, because I've grown it. I have never had seedlings <laughs> uh, emerge, and I think that's why you probably don't see a lot of. Um, hybrid populations. I think Tony mentioned there was one on the peninsula, but, um, you know, and, and in Awada, I've seen a couple, you know, maybe one out of a 500 plants as a white sage, black sage hybrid. Um, but there's probably something to the fact that that you're not seeing a bunch of those, you know, starting their own population. I, I've seen it more at nurseries, where nurseries are growing hundreds of plants. They have the Cleveland close to the Salvia Piana, uh, maybe close to something else. Then you'll see some of the crossing in some of their, I guess maybe they're using the seeds from some of those plants. And that's the place I've seen it. Uh, white sage and black sage. I've actually ha accidentally gotten some of those. So. Maybe we'll have zebra sage one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, did either of uh, Deb or uh, Rose, uh, did you want to add any comments or, or, or say anything? Yes, I, I do. Um, Please. Um, you know, Etiwanda is kind of a place we were able to find evidence because the rangers there keep catching people, even though it's a protected area. But outside of Etiwanda, it is being taken as well. And nobody is watching those areas for the most part. Uh, we even had a, a person we know very well who has a large acreage in, um, out in uh, San Bernardino County and has a lot of white sage on her property. She keeps the majority of her property um, you know, undeveloped. And she's had people literally run over her fence with trucks and fill up these 50 gallon trash cans and just rip plants right out of the ground because uh, the ripping out of the ground, partially the reason they do that is because they're probably planning on doing the oil, which we also discuss in the film. Um, we found oil being sold on Alibaba. I think Deborah was the one who discovered this and it was um, a gallon of white sage oil. I can't remember what the cost was, but it was coming from Juniper Ridge. Alibaba is like the worldwide Amazon. Um, and we were shocked. And then they tell you how much they can provide. And we've seen at Sagewind Farm them making uh, oil. And in the film, we show them making, I, I can't even tell you how small amount it is. It's something like, um, what a half an ounce maybe uh took 12 pounds of sage and ken at sagewind farm was trying to provide oil for someone who was asking for uh, a quite a bit of it uh and he was charging 1800 dollars for i think it was a, a two pint container a, what is that a quart um and but it was going to take him forever to get to, to it so um, that is uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when they take the plants, they're not just clipping the tips either when they're doing this wild crafting. In some cases, they're just taking everything as fast as they can. Um, the other thing uh, 
I want to say is a lot of Native people keep telling me it's not just white sage. They're taking acorns. Uh, a lot of Native people still do a lot of traditional gathering. Um, I've had people tell me, well, they never see them. Well, of course you don't. <laughs> they don't they don't go out there and want everybody to see them you shouldn't see that they were even there they're the traditional way is to you know to uh, go and just take what you need and not harm anything because you plan on being there next year and this has been going on uh, for thousands of years and so they're taking acorns uh they're taking yerba santas showing up in these online stores as well as local shops uh crystal shops um uh and uh, Palo Santo, uh, of course, comes from south, but uh, there people are complaining about the Palo Santo, uh, cedar, juniper, mugwort, sweetgrass, and this Artemisia sagebrush. So if you see any of these plants, you really shouldn't be uh, purchasing them. You should actually question the, the retailer um, or the person selling it at a farmer's market and find out where they're getting it from. And people need to be feel uncomfortable. If they're doing something illegal, we need to make them feel uncomfortable about it, that we don't accept this and we need to stop buying those products. Good point. Uh, Emory, do you have anything you wanted to add? No, no, that's okay. Okay, we have one more question. Has Juniper Ridge made uh, changes or released any statements regarding decrease in risk? the harvesting of white sage. Oh, Deborah can speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kept track of things. I'm really glad I did. I did screenshots when we first started doing this, not thinking that, you know, they will take down that store locator because that was shocking. And when David showed that slide that, you know, we had, I had done the, um, written down all the different cities because I found it astounding that you could buy their products in Taiwan or in Helsinki or Madrid. And it was just mind boggling. And Rosie and I tell audiences, you know, we bought their product when it's not, they're very, you know, they've got a great website there. It's beautiful. They make it sound really cool to go out there and gather things in the wild. But we had no idea that that's what they were doing. They, you know, they're really um, design people actually use their website as an example of great design and great marketing. So they're really masters at that. But we did ask them, we did, when we were writing an article called, um, say, well, it was the original article called Saging the World and it was in News for Native California. We did contact them to ask um, about where they got their sage. And um, because they were, at one point they um, said that they were now farming it. And then we asked to see we said we'd love to go visit the farm. We'd go travel there and visit the farm. And then we never heard back from them. And um, one of the things that happened was their, their, uh, the president or CEO of, of Juniper Ridge named, um, what was his name, Hal Newbegin. He's no longer with us, he's passed, but um, he wrote an article justifying you know, their ways of, of gathering things like white sage. And he, he talked about how they've been out there and they have permits and this, but he, but he actually gave a great, synopsis of what's happening he says the crews are out there and they're just destroying everything and it's really grody and then he said you shouldn't necessarily trust business folks like myself but you know i'm doing it in a good way they're doing it in bad ways i mean it was this really sort of insane article about how i'm okay but everybody else is not okay but it, you know he sort of slits his own throat i think but um so i would say juniper ridge then he's no longer the ceo but i don't sense a big ship they're still they have still have tons of products they don't let us look at their store locator anymore, but they still have, if you put in your, you know, your zip code in their store locator now, you'll see tons of shops. They sell it everywhere. Their products are everywhere. And they do still pride themselves on wild crafting. They don't say they're wild crafting, that they're changing their language. You're going to see this in a lot of sites now. People are changing their language. They're maybe no longer saying wild crafted. They might, I mean, some are, they're not, they haven't caught on. But what's going to also happen is people will start using the term sustainable or they'll even put those little stickers, US, what is it, the USDA or organic label on their product. And you can tell it's Photoshopped. I mean, it's amazing. And the way you know that is because they also say things like, read our little booklet on smudging and you will then be a, a, shaman, a shaman level pro after reading their booklet. And it's so, that's insulting to every indigenous you know, group in the world, right? To say that after reading a little e-booklet, you're gonna be a yeah, I mean, there's just astounding things like that. But anybody who knows how to use Photoshop, who's a beginner Photoshopper, can put a, a little sticker on their product. 
And then when you go to their site, they actually have a website and, and it goes nowhere. I mean, so people have to be a little savvy about what they're seeing on the internet too. So I don't know. So yeah, Juniper Ridge, I'm not sure. I guess that's where I'd leave it. But I won't buy their products at this point still, so. Okay. Um, did you guys talk about this company called California White Sage? Is that the one you were talking about earlier? California White Sage in San Diego, I believe, is the uh, son of uh, Ken and Ellen, who started, uh, yeah, it grows better along the coast. If you saw in that trailer, uh, Ellen was pulling the hose through the field of sage they're growing. It, at that point in time, it looked pretty bad because they just hadn't had any rain for a long time. And she literally is out there watering them. Uh, we've been there before where the sage has been six feet tall and beautiful flowering. So, um, uh, so it's harder to grow where they are in Hakumba uh, than it is where the California Sage Company is in San Diego County. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I was looking, I was trying to look up Juniper Ridge while we were talking, and, and this California White Sage came up, and it said it's all farmed and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so in the oil. Um, uh, they have a five milliliter bottle for fourteen dollars. So, wow, wow, that's a lot of sage. <laughs> I hope they are farming it, but I don't know why they resisted in having us come out because they were when we put that article out a couple of years ago. Uh, we heard from them because we mentioned them in the article, mm -hmm. and um, you know we just said, "Well, show us, you know, show us where you grow this," but. They've never really talked to us again, so. We think that if you were growing, um, organically grown white sage and you're doing it in an ethical way, you would want people to know that because there's so many people that are doing it unscrupulously. So you yeah. would be very proud of the product. So the fact that they don't reveal anything and um, you know they don't wanna show you or really have a conversation really about where that's from. Um, and it's also interesting, they say they give 10% of their profits to indigenous groups. <laughs> I'm thinking, I hope a lot of people aren't taking it from them, but um, anyway, it just, I don't know, it just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yep, yep. Well, that, that brings up an interesting question is, you know, these places that donate money to, to various different groups, um, it, it often then forms a sort of self-censorship because you, you get money from those people and so you don't really want to put them off. Um, so that's always a little bit of a problem. Anyway, um, all right, so there's a couple more comments here. Um, well, I, I wanna say real quick too, that it isn't just Juniper Ridge. Um, there are some certain people, native people have tried, attempted to talk to some of these um, sellers. One is in, uh, New Mexico, um, Taos Herbs, I think they're called. Um, and they just keep saying that they're buying it from native people who are growing it in Anza Borrego on the reservation in Anza Borrego and stuff. And we've never been able to verify any such thing. And even if they did, that would be tons because they sell tons of white sage and we don't think that's even possible. So we've, we've tried to find, uh, you know, we think if they, like Deborah said, if they were growing it, uh, especially if it was organic, they'd be shouting at us about it. They would be wanting everybody to know so they could get the business and they could get the, you know, the yeah. pat on the back. Yeah, Mountain Rose Herbs was the um, one that was you were thinking of. Um, Mountain, and Mountain Rose Herbs is, the, yeah, it's a huge company up in, herbal company. It's really well respected up in Oregon. And they sold both wild gathered sage and they sold um, farm sage. And they made a transition and they made a big deal about it. They went totally with farm sage only, no more wild gathered sage. But they wrote a letter to all the people that ever, you know, bought things from them. And, you know, and a lot of the people I know um, and work with here, a lot of the native people, they've used them for some of their products too. Um, you know, people who do workshops and need bigger quantities of things. And so I was really glad to see that. And they talked about their farm, which is here in San Diego County. And, um, but they made a big deal about this transition and they talked about why they were doing it because of the environment and because of native people wanting that. And so I, you know, it just made sense that they would make a big deal about it. And then you feel really good about buying from Mountain Rose Herbs. 
And, you know, I mean, it just makes sense as a business, as a business to do that. If you're going to go to the effort of farming something and you were well gathering, then make a big deal about it. And, and your customers will love you. Yeah. You I mean, think. it just, you would think, yeah. Yeah. So there's another comment here from D in the chat. Uh, the poaching is heartbreaking for the indigenous people and for all people. Uh, thank you for this documentary. I'm hopeful it will bring awareness and solutions. I particularly loved discussing the relationship between people and the Earth's resources. That is compelling for me. So that's a, a really good point. There's one more Thank comment you. here. Um, really appreciate the discussion of the negative aspects of poaching and understanding the relationships. Um, and David Bryant says, uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, as far as I know, our development team hasn't, oh, there's something else. Um, Kathy had pointed out that I think it was Juniper Ridge says they give some amount of money or they list CNPS uh, as a, uh, <gasps> as an organization that they donate money. So David, uh -oh, Bryan David, says, David Bryan <laughs> says, as far as I know, our development team hasn't received any donations. I'll check with them. They might have given to a chapter or provided anon anonymously to our general fund. So, yeah, I mean, the, the problem in our society is that, you know, money, money is, you know, all pervasive. And, you know, people uh, often are giving to various different organizations. And then they have, again, like I said earlier, they, they, you know, you take money from somebody and it's hard not to, you know, um, but once you've taken money from somebody, then it, it's, you know, that much harder to criticize them. So um, I know there's been some discussion in, in the chapter council um, about, you know, criteria for donations and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a concern. Um, anyway. Well, well, I think in, in this case, too, it's just greenwashing. I mean, if you look at all of the organizations that they give to, it's just it's just clear to me that they're kind of laundering their image through the all of the work that these conservation orgs are doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, washing is a, a huge problem. Uh, and yeah, people like, like um, I think Deb who said one of the companies said they give 10 percent of their profits the indigenous people. Well, you know, but in the meantime, they're they're you know pillaging your land and and you know, and that's only 10% of their profit. So how much other are they making, you know? Yeah, exactly. Typically profits are after, you know, in a company that's after you've paid yourself your salary and what have you. So anyway. Um I wanna I wanna also say that I think one of our hopes is we know that uh, right now, our big focus is to educate, especially the consumer, because there are a lot of people who've been buying the, the sage and have been trying to use it maybe for a positive purpose, but, you know, hopefully they'll discover maybe what their purchasing dollar has been doing that they won't like, and they'll stop, you know, the consumer has to be critical more critical about how they spend their money and they need to start asking questions because this is not just affecting native people this is our environment and it, that would, that's already always in trouble and by growing it or by buying it from an organic farmer you're really kind of helping battle climate change and the development the damage from development and, and and it's something easy to do, even if you grow it in a pot, white sage could be grown in a pot. Uh, so if whether it's a community garden, a pot at home or a yard or your parents yard or family and friends yards, um, it really is, a, it's, it's a way to do something positive for our environment and our pollinators. So, um... I have uh, two more questions. The first one is, uh, are there alternatives or, or uh, to white sage? And I guess the, the broader part of that question is, um, in every, I, I'm sure that there's native peoples uh, from other parts of the world 
who use other things for their ceremonies. And so I think it's important that people become aware of what traditionally was used in their area so that they could grow it in their own houses or yards or community gardens. So the question is, is there some other alternative? Well, you know, that's really interesting because um, that's what a lot of people started panicking when we first started giving talks about this pre-pandemic about the, what we had discovered with the white sage. And you know, the, the flora issue, the spring issue is dedicated to white sage. And one of the articles is by Susan Leopold from the United Plant Savers. And she talks about how the, uh, the cooking sage that, that is bought in the market for cooking in your kitchen was from Albania and used to be poached. And they started growing it and domesticating it because it was just disappearing. Um, so I think uh, alternatives, there's alternative ways, but there's also, I think everybody should really take a look in their own, what exactly are they doing with the sage? If they're doing some sort of ceremony, is it their traditional from their heritage? And maybe they should do some research. You know, people use rosemary sometimes and rosemary, it's like we all grow rosemary. Um, so there are some things that could be used, but the main thing about using the white sage is if you're not, white sage in Saliapiana is really only a California Indian and we're including Baja, of course. Uh, it's only, that's the only people who used to use it traditionally. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's, you know, if you're outside of that, even if you're native from another area, you have to still look back and see what your plants are because it has become even ubiquitous in the native communities all across, you know, north north of our border and south of our border. Um, uh, it's being used. Mexico City uses a lot of white sage, uh, but a lot of these people, it's been done for so many decades now, many people have no clue where this plant comes from. And, and some people even said they thought it was grown in China because there was so much of it. So I think everybody should do a little looking into what they would like and try different plants that you either can grow or have access to. Okay. Tony uh, wrote in the, the uh, chat, lavender, juniper, mugwort, and sagebrush as potential other things that one could use. Um, but um, yeah, I think that um, it, it's important that yeah, we identify what we're trying to accomplish and that we um, uh, um, you know, just be aware of where we're getting the, the plants from and, and really, as, uh, as you said, have a, learn to have a relationship with the plants. Um, so I guess my other question, um, kind of a broad question and I don't expect you to answer it here, but my first thought is when I heard about this, that it, it's great. My first thought was it's great that so many people are trying to learn something from uh, Native American culture and, and, and all. Um, that was my first thought in, in you know, seeing the document or seeing the trailer and hearing the presentation you know, I realized that it, it has created this huge problem. Um, but I guess my question, sort of broader question is, you know, Native people have lived, people have lived here in, in United States for, you know, tens of thousands of years, um, or at least more than 10,000 years. And I think we as, as immigrants have, you know, something to learn from the people that have been here for a long time. And so I guess my question, is, and I don't expect an answer now because it's a huge question, but what can we learn and how can we learn it? And you know, in a, in a culturally sensitive way. Um, and I realized that you know, just putting on feathers or something like that and chanting uh, you know, is, is, is not really necessarily picking up on the true spirit. And certainly reading a booklet or, you know, uh, a, a two paragraph booklet is not going to make one into a shaman who, you know, <laughs> you know, study their life and, and, and 
really dedicated their life to it. But my, you know, how can we use this film to to get people to learn uh, about you know the, the, the cultures and, and and what things can we learn and how how can we as people as immigrants learn about their culture? Um, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things we say uh, as to what people can do is to learn about the cultures, the cultures near you, where you live, whose land are you living on, um, what tribes are there, um, and, and learn about them. Um, as for using the plants, that part of it, um, you know, unless the ceremony is shared with you, you're not supposed to do a traditional ceremony. But one of the things about ceremony and white sage is that it probably was used more for funerals than anything else. And of course the stereotype has become negative energy. Well, that might be coming from funeral uses, funerary uses. Um, and I think people should know these things. They should know what these plants were used for and not try to copy them, but be sensitive to them and maybe have, a re have respect for a plant that was so important and is so important um, to California native people. If you have that respect for the plant, you can grow it, you can enjoy it, and you don't have to sit there and do any pseudo ceremony. You know, the one of the things Willie Pink is um, uh, is uh, Luis Seno Cupeno down here um, in uh, Temecula, and he says our most sacred plant in the Luis Seno culture is the elderberry because they found twenty seven uses for elderberry. You know, besides the common tea made from the flowers and that sort of, or the berries. Uh, for for when you're sick, there's many many uses that people have used and continue to use elderberry for, and that's how respect for the plants and the sacredness of the plants, it, it, you know, evolves. It's because it helps people, it helps people survive. And if you think of things like yerba santa, I, I'm just sometimes I'm really just amazed because yerba santa, you know, uh, spreads by the roots. So you find these huge clusters when you find it uh, in undeveloped areas. And Yerba Santa is extreme. It's called Yerba Santa because it is so medicinal. It is incredibly medicinal. And, and, and yet I might go to that same place the next year and see houses. And here we've, we have you know, no uh, the general, I guess developers and the general population have no concept sometimes of what they're destroying. It could be the cure for cancer. We've said this about, we've said this about um, the Amazon that we still don't even know, we're, it's being destroyed and we still don't even know everything that it potentially can give us. But this is true for here, this is true. We have a biome here. We have so many native plants that can do so many things that native people have used. Ethnobotany started with native people. It's studying native people's uses of these plants that they've done, that they've did the trial and error for thousands of years. And we should, we should look at this with a lot of respect for the, these cultures, these native cultures. Well, there's one more comment here. Uh, volunteering in your local California native plant gardens is a great way to come away smelling like sage. Uh, so on a, that's on a little lighter note here. Um, so we're getting uh, close to nine o'clock. Uh, I think we should uh, end the formal meeting. Um, and I really appreciate, uh, David, your work and, and Rose and Deb. Um, you all put a, obviously a lot into this. And, and I really think um, that your movie is going to enlighten people and really uh, hopefully uh, you know, make people aware of what they're doing and uh, allow people I think, you know, part, part of it is if you do some, something with genuine belief, um, you know, rather than sort of frivolously, uh, if you really believe in what you're doing, then, then it, it's more meaningful. So anyway, I thank everybody for uh, participating and um, 
uh, we could end the recording and if people wanted to sort of chat informally, that's fine with me.